Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this Monday night, March 27th, in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Our first animation today starts off with a view of the winds across uh, the Pacific Ocean. So this is near surface winds. We can see a series of deeper lows that are kind of stacked up here across the Pacific Ocean. And given the current flow coming across the Pacific, we expect each of these to have an impact on United States weather. If we just step up to the jet stream level, this is what we've got. So the jet is split. We do have a one piece running to the north and it breaks apart. And then there is a subtropical component to the jet. And just in general, what we've seen is something like this. And things seem to be meeting coming out of the north along the west coast and this direction across Mexico and just setting things off across the rest of the United States. This is a very active look to the flow. What would change it would be um, some sort of large blocking ridge um, you know, somewhere along the west coast or deep troughs hitting Alaska, something we're going to talk about in a few moments here. But this is the pattern we've been in for most of March. Let me just show you what it looks like. If you look at the jet stream level winds and then compare them to average, can you see how this has been the preferred flow? And when you get that particular setup, it has no difficulty drawing moisture out of the Gulf pretty far to the north. This has the shear environment necessary to produce, um, you know, just a lot of, um, you know, high impact weather events like the severe weather we saw this past weekend down over parts of the south and southeast and lower Mississippi River Valley in between. And also keeps a lot of cold air anchored in this trough. And that's been the problem with the pattern that we've been seeing. This is, we've really not had anything to displace this pattern in quite some time. So because this pattern still is kind of on this uh, wash, rinse, repeat cycle for at least now through the beginning of April, we're going to watch more of these troughs like this one right here sneak through. Now we have a lead wave. It's not much, but this little wave here, but we're keeping an eye as we go through the day on Tuesday of this deeper trough rolling down the West Coast right here. Now, as that goes across, I just want to let you know, there was a lead wave. There's the short wave that's coming here. Now it by Thursday, it's already moving into parts of Quebec. I'll show you what that one's going to do in a few moments. But my eye is really being kept on this one because as the models show, by Thursday night, this is making it over the four corner states. This is a deep trough that's going to eject out here in the plains. So we're going to watch out as the warm sector opens up here on Thursday in a bigger area on Friday for the risk of these strong to severe storms. And that trough kicks through, and that's where it'll be by Friday night, and then pulls all the way into parts of New England by the time we get into Saturday. Now, just as we talked about, there'll be a system following it. You can see it right here. And that system will dive down into the west and also produce a deep trough about a week uh, in between. And here it comes out of California, and that one will eventually eject into the central United States as well. So what we need to assess here is what these next few systems are going to do to add to what March has already given us. So first of all, uh, just to be prepared for this, on Thursday, the Storm Prediction Center has already issued a day four outlook. And this, again, has been quite consistent for the last couple of days on where they're honing in on the risk for severe storms. And day five, they've opened up. It's pretty large. I don't remember um, seeing a day five region quite this large. That, that doesn't mean anything. That just means the setup is good, um, that they're kind of keeping an eye out from uh, parts of Arkansas through Illinois. So we need to keep an eye out on this particular region at the end of this week. This is Thursday through Friday into early Saturday morning. All right. Now, when we add up all the precipitation from this, we're just going to get a repeat of what we've been seeing. So I'll just play this quickly so you can get it all in here. Well, let's go ahead and take this out 10 days. So what, what do I mean by a repeat? Well, still extremely wet in the West. And we'll take a look at these snowfall totals in a few moments. This is the area that stays dry. We're also drier in the Canadian prairie. Snow here, severe storms and heavy rain in this corridor and all kind of moves its way into New England. That's the next 10 days as we look at it from the European model. We'll go into more detail about this in a second. But what's important is just to say, well, where were we just uh, in terms of the last week? So we examined this in this morning's video, but just to bring this back up again for those that uh, tend to just watch the Tuesday, Thursday videos or the Monday night, Thursday night video, excuse me. I just want to point out how wet things have been in this area. Of course, we had the severe weather outbreak that happened on Friday, another one on Saturday, and then continued severe storms on Sunday. Uh, you add all this up, we had over 500 reports of severe weather. There were numerous fatalities from this. And the storm that uh, two of the storms that went through parts of Mississippi, uh, one of them was ranked as an EF4. That was the one that went through Rolling Fork, uh, Mississippi. Um, elsewhere in this pattern, we had some snow. We're going to go talk about that in just a few moments. But I want to show you a, a different style of soil moisture map than I'm, I usually show you. This is relative soil moisture, and it, we consider it to be the water that's available. 
All right, so this is in a percent. Now, as you examine this, where we've had all that very heavy rainfall down here, uh, we're saturated. And there's a lot of flooding going on in this region. You then look at it and say, well, why are these soil moisture values so low? Well, we still have snow that's sitting on top of all of this, and there's long-standing drought in this part of the country. So what we need to do is take a look at what that snow looks like, because just here over the last three days, we've added a whole lot more here into the Rocky Mountains that come into Montana. Uh, we've even added some more to the upper Colorado Basin, then into the western plains here, stretching through Nebraska and Iowa. And then again, this was on Saturday, uh, the snow that spread here, or Friday into Saturday, that spread into parts of uh, eastern Iowa, northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin, and Michigan. Now, when we do a little comparison, I want to show you the newest data here. This is interesting. This is where things sat a year ago. So this is what our snow cover looked like last year. This is this year. And again, last year, look at the differences in the west or in the northern plains. And we just had an event that rolled through here in the eastern uh, Corn Belt, eastern Great Lakes region when this particular map was made. But this is compared to this year. So again, there's 2 to 12 inches of liquid here in the snow stretching from uh, North Dakota through the UP of Michigan. And we've examined how much snow is in the west. But just to do that again, in case you didn't see it in my morning report, this is current snow water equivalent for the west. And I just want to take a moment to show you what it looked like a year ago. So th the differences here are just incredible. Uh, you know, we have some places in the Sierra Nevada that have had over 60 feet of snow this winter. The upper Colorado Basin's at 45%, 145%, excuse me, of normal snow. And we've even seen these snows moving into Oregon and into southern Idaho through the Snake River Valley, two places that really needed to see a lot more of this moisture. All right, so that's just a quick look back at what our snow situation looks like. As we go forward, just as you can imagine, with deeper troughs still sitting over the west, systems dive to the south and they run this direction. So this is where all the warmth is, but there's just plenty of cold air trapped into this trough that now we see there's this corridor right in through here where we're expecting more snow. So let's just step through this. This is a 10-day forecast map looking at the probability of getting at least three inches. Here we can step it up to six inches. So this is a better than 50% chance in through here of grabbing another six inches of snow over the next 10 days. This is a foot, and now our focus is really just gonna go west. 18 inches, 24 inches, so we have a lot more. Another couple of feet, maybe more coming into parts of the Sierra Nevada, the Klamath uh, Mountains in the north, and then the Cascades here. In fact, we can just keep going up. That's the probability of getting 36 inches of snow uh, out of the next 10 days. Now, if we put all this into a broader context, that we can look back at the month of March and try to see what the precipitation ranks by climate district look like. So after last week's precipitation, we now see these ranks very high, but we've been drier over in Virginia. Better moisture came through North Carolina last night and this morning. Uh, we've seen some improvement down here along the Gulf, which is good, but notice that we're still, um, you know, this particular sector of Kansas in um, the month of March is having its third driest March on record, while the West, which continues to pack up with snow, uh, has been very, very, um, very, very wet. On the temperature side of it, we've now seen multiple shots of colder air coming across the Midwest. But I would like to point out that we still have two climate reporting districts having their coldest start, excuse me, coldest March on record up to this point. So we have big questions about this pattern. When will it break? When will we start to see spring finally arriving for much of the country? And we need to discuss what the pattern must do in order to get us there. So I've got some, I guess, I guess we'll do the bad news first. This was just released today uh, on Monday from the Climate Prediction Center. This is their look, outlook for the 4th of, of April through the 10th of April. And this is the risk of hazardous temperatures. And so what we notice here is that throughout much of the West, parts of the Plains, upper Midwest, and the Northern Plains have a slight to moderate risk of seeing cold conditions continue. If we flip this over to the precipitation side, I mean, it looks just like I've showed you, right? The greatest risk of staying much wetter than average is going to be in the Tennessee Valley, the Ohio Valley, the lower Mississippi River Valley, getting over toward the Appalachian Mountains, the western side of them. In terms of the snow risk, I completely agree with this as well. Of course, more in the Sierra Nevada, but we're still keeping an eye out on this area until this pattern breaks to see potentially more snow coming through. And on the wind side of it, they've got a large sector here of the west and the plains getting the upper Midwest where there is a slight risk for having above average winds. So that means that the pattern we just detailed at the beginning of this video looks to be sticking around for quite some time. Now, what is that pattern again? 
A lot of it has to do with ridging we've seen here that's extended at times into Alaska. That's pushed deeper troughs into the west. And because of this subtropical ridge, the patterns tried to run up into this area. There's been a lot of blocking, high latitude blocking sitting here between Greenland. Uh, actually, I should make the arrow go the other way. There it is. Between Greenland and the Hudson Bay, which is helping to just reinforce broad troughing here and broad troughing there, those two areas. That's the pattern we're trying to see get knocked out. So can I do this for you real quick? I'm just going to play for you the next 15 days from the European Ensemble. What we're looking for here is change anything to get us away from this. Because you notice that right now there's troughs in the west. There's broad troughing here. There's a ridge in Alaska. There's a ridge off the Aleutian Islands. And all of that is very much like what we've been seeing. So I'm going to click play. We're going to look for some shifting here. We know that there are at least two high impact systems, one going through there late this week and one early next week coming from the west through the Midwest. We continue to see, at least through the 7th of April, deeper, excuse me, larger ridges in that area that they've been. But look at this. Once we get out there, let me pause that, sorry. Once we get out here past, you know, the 6th or 7th, where we're still in that pattern, okay, I start to see something that will be very important going into mid-April. And that is that the atmosphere has lock, lost some of its high amplitude blocking here. There's now some troughs that are coming into Alaska. And that is a shift. If this actually manifests itself, that's a significant shift in the pattern, which could be finally pushing the last bit of this colder air east. But we're not getting here until we get, you know, April 11th, 12th, 13th. I mean, it's got to be past mid-month that we're really going to see this pattern start to shift. So let's just make a quick jump from there and say, what are the models suggesting for mid-April to mid-May? And right now at this point, I'm, I'm going to draw it on here so you don't forget. I think we got to put a big question mark on this. You notice that the precipitation pattern staying wet from Texas all throughout the southeast up to the mid-Atlantic. It's actually wet throughout much of the Midwest, wet out of the northern plains. A little bit of a drier look for the western United States. But this is the thing that I'm trying to question Will we actually see a continuation of this cold pattern all the way to May 12th? Right now, the European model is not letting go of this. And I just, there are some times I look at it and go, I know, I know why it's not letting go of it. And this is a time where I'm saying, I don't know why it's not letting go of this pattern. And let me just make a case for why I think that is. This is the first piece of it. We noticed that the um, CPC has got almost an identical forecast for the next two weeks. Uh, excuse me, the CFSV2, that's our climate forecasting system model from the CPC. It's got a very similar look to nearly every forecast model out there through the April 9th. What is interesting is that the model, uh, the 10th through the 16th, is trying to break things up a bit, reduce the magnitude of this cold air, but then it does something a bit wild. It tries to just shove it all east after the 17th. Now remember, we have to do that. We've got to displace this cold air away from the west to start to get a pattern change. So I'm looking for that pattern change after mid-month to bring in more sustained warmth. So I, I need to just ask, what does it take for the contiguous U.S. to just bust away into warm conditions? So using the climate at a glance tool from NOAA, I went back and looked at all Aprils, went back to 1895, and looked at the average temperatures. And what I'm attempting to do is pull off all these warm Aprils going back to about 1970 and say, what did they have? Well, they looked like this. Instead of having a big blocking ridge here, the ridge was there or it was here. Instead of having a big ridge over Alaska, it's gone. There's a trough. We need to completely shift the pattern about 180 degrees from where it is to get, well, the trough that's here to get out, ridging to build into the central part of the United States. And that all begins with a, la a lack excuse me, of high latitude blocking in this area. Now, what can promote that along, what can push us in this direction, is if the MJO will move, get back out here into the open Pacific Ocean, phases 7, 8, or even phase 1. Now, are we seeing that happening? That's the, that's the question. A few moments ago, I showed you. We noticed that by April 11th, at least we are no longer seeing big ridges here or a big ridge over Alaska. That's two pieces to this we need to get rid of. But is the MJO actually going to go over here? Well, I'll show you that the EPS model 
right now is trying to produce stronger sinking motion in the atmosphere here. That often results in better rising motion in this area. That's the European model. If I were to flip this over and show you the GFS Ensemble, it's even got more dramatic sinking motion here and starting to see some rising motion happening in this part of the Pacific. That is also a good signal. But the reason why the European model cannot shake this is that this is, whoops, this is its current signal from the, uh, from the uh, ensemble, or, excuse me, the European long range ensemble suggesting that the MJO just comes and farts around in here. If it comes through and sweeps out phases six, seven, eight, we're in business. We will see a warm up past mid month, a significant warm up. But that's what's got to happen. These are the things that we need to watch change. All right. A quick hit on El Nino. I'm waiting. Let's, fact, let's do an update on this. Nope, no changes. I'm waiting on the 28th of March, which is tomorrow for us, Tuesday, but it actually is already Tuesday in Australia. So I'm waiting for them to update their latest forecast for El Nino. I'll be putting that in the reports later this week and we'll cover it again. But I want to let you know that uh, the Australians will be the first to get out their newest report on this. So we'll keep a close eye on, on what they're looking at. Um, remember that they were the most aggressive at bringing in El Nino conditions by, by our summer. So we'll come back to this soon. So now you know what I'm watching for in terms of breaking this pattern up and getting it to shift around. So in each report, when we kind of cover these changes, we'll know maybe how soon we can get there. In the near term, though, we got to come, come back and cover this. We're still locked into the current pattern. And today's satellite imagery just offered a pretty amazing view of what's going on here. Now, my attention was drawn. I live in Illinois. So I was looking right here at this snow swath and the snow that was sitting here from the weekend. It was neat to see today both the road. Isn't that neat? So you can just see the impact of the high March sun angles, getting rid of that snow there and here. But you can also see um, this depth and just magnitude of the snowpack that's out of the Canadian prairie to Montana, getting into North and South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and the UP. There's just a tremendous amount of snow. And I might be asking, why does it look so much brighter here than here? Well, of course, if you've ever been here, you know that there's just pine trees everywhere. There's lots of forest, and that's why it looks darker. There's still a lot of snow in that area. Okay, <clears throat> at the very end of this animation, we get a little bit better view of the system that's coming into the West. But I'm going to take you over there to show you yet again one of these highly dynamic deep lows that's off the coast. And here it is. And so it's going to have multiple frontal boundaries that push into the West. It is also important to note that from this view, we could get a good glimpse today at the snowpack throughout Oregon into Idaho. Look at all the snow on this side of the Snake River Valley and throughout the mountains here in Montana. You can also see what's going on in Nevada where the cold is anchored. Utah, I mean, I can keep going through this, but you get the idea. That's the low we got to watch right here. Okay, we have winter storm warnings out, high wind advisories out, red flag warnings here, winter weather advisory. There's actually a preceding little um, short wave that we need to keep an eye on here. Let's go right on into the high res NAM. Let's pick this up this afternoon or this evening here on Monday at seven o'clock. So leading wave is here. One that's exiting is there, and here's the new one entering the United States. So through the night tonight, we do have more snow coming with this wave, and you'll notice that there is a, uh, it's kind of a clipper type system rolling through the Canadian prairie. So by Tuesday midday, we watch that main boundary come in, snow in Northern California, snow into Oregon, and we're going to watch these two systems kind of work together. One out ahead of it, leaving a frontal boundary through here, bringing in some snow. So this is getting into late Tuesday night and Wednesday morning. And that snow is going to move over the eastern Great Lakes, possibly clip all the way down as far south as like Chicago over to the Quad Cities, maybe a little bit of snow. But this is all on the edge of this high pressure cell. And while that's happening, let me take you back and watch the west coast. That load just continues to spin right here along the coast. So in three days, it went that far. So we see the first bands moving through you know, Idaho into Montana, Nevada, Utah, still more rain coming into California out of this. To see where it goes from there, we need to flip over to the comparison between today's 12Z roundup, the European model and the GFS. So here we go. Let's play through Tuesday morning, afternoon and evening. Now let's stretch this out to Wednesday morning. And there's that frontal battery sliding through here on Wednesday. We then play out to when that low finally makes its way onto California's coast by Thursday morning and it's going to get wrapped up into a deeper trough throughout the west and notice how both models in the overnight hours 
on Thursday are expecting to see some storms here. Now, it doesn't look like much, but this big ridge of high pressure is pumping moisture into it. It's in both models. See it there? And we're going to watch this low basically run this trajectory. Now, that's a lifting low. It's moving toward the north and east. So this is Friday morning, Friday afternoon, and Friday evening. And this is where all of our modeling systems are kind of opening up a corridor in through here where we're expecting to see those strong to severe storms. So let's be aware of this situation going later into this week. Remember, the Storm Prediction Center has already put out a day five risk on Friday for this on the backside snow. As we play this forward, that system clears through New England. Large warm sector opens up, so that's why we see so much rain here. But there'll be snow from Ontario, excuse me, from Quebec and Ontario, and then into Michigan after this put down some snow in the Midwest. We then watch the system that follows it. See it here? And that one comes into the Pacific Northwest. Look at the snow coming into the Cascade Mountains and into the Northern Rockies. This is a lot of late season snow on Saturday. And then that low comes out next Tuesday into Wednesday. And again, we have another system that's following this trajectory. So the first one does this, the second one does something like that. So the pattern stays very active. Let's do a little model comparison on snow, European model first. So again, there's the little front bringing some light snow. We see the low curling into California. We've already known that there could be up to three feet of snow out of this. And then when that low ejects later this week, Friday into Saturday morning, that's the heavy snow swath right there. Remember, by Saturday morning, the next low is coming into the west, northwest, excuse me. So now we're adding up even more snow to the Cascades and the northern Rockies in Idaho and Montana. So if I just take this out there to a seven-day forecast, this is what you get. Now, if we look at the GFS, there are some similarities. Now, notice there's a snow swath through here. But the GFS is a bit farther to the north on this when compared to the European. The GFS has similar snowfall totals for the west, though. From here, let's go look at how much precipitation we're looking to get out of the next 10 days. Probability of grabbing at least an inch of liquid, shown here. Let's step it up to two inches. So we notice that this whole area, which has been um, hit hard in the last several weeks with wet conditions, is expected to remain quite wet in this pattern, up to a 50% chance of getting two inches of, of precipitation in the next 10 days. Uh, where is it dry? This is the probability of getting less than a half inch of precipitation in the next 10 days. And again, we identify those same corridors as we had been talking about. All right, from here, let's go look at just the week two precipitation forecast. And again, mostly this is capturing that third system that comes through next Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday time frame, And that's why we see open Gulf moisture and just another repeat setup of what we've been talking about here. All right, lastly, I wanna talk about temperatures. I'm just gonna play this animation quickly for you because I am trying to assess if we have remaining frost threat for the south, southeast from Texas all the way over to you know, the Carolinas. So we're gonna do this relatively quickly. There are no numbers on this. I just want you to watch this contour line. That is the freezing contour line, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And as I play from Monday into Tuesday, okay, we can get that cooler air through parts of the Ohio Valley. We go from there into Wednesday morning there it is, Wednesday morning. So a lot of patchy frost still hitting these same areas. We then go out here to Thursday morning, Friday morning. That's when the warm sector is wide open. Getting into Saturday morning, Sunday morning, Monday morning, Tuesday morning. <laughs> Do you notice that we're not really seeing the models driving cold air deep into the south again? That was something I was worried was going to happen. Now the new 10-day forecast tries to keep that area under the protection of more ridging. All of this is because of the depth of this trough sending systems in this direction. So for the next 10 days, looking at temperatures compared to average, we see where the coldest air is anchored in the Canadian Prairie, Montana, Northern Plains, and throughout the Intermountain West. And more mild conditions from Texas through the Tennessee and Ohio Valley at times, getting over to the east. If we just try to see if the models have picked up on that mid-month pattern break, let's just slide through here, a five-day sliding window of average temperature anomalies. You're going to see a lot of what I just showed you. Colder air staying anchored where it's been. But at the very end of this animation, you start to see this cold air being displaced a bit further to the east and less extreme cold in the Pacific Northwest. And that could be when we're talking about this pattern finally making a move. 
So that's what I'm watching. Watch Alaska. That's the rule of the, or the, the moral of the story today. I want to finish up with a bit on South America. A couple of graphics here. This is from Buenos Aires. Just to show you how extreme those temperatures were. This was the heat in early February, followed by the near frost, then backed up with about three to four weeks of constant heat. And during that time period, Buenos Aires did not get a lot of precipitation. You can see that there were events, but they did not make up for these long-standing deficits. I want to slide you over toward, um, let's see if we can go here. How about to Cordoba? I'll just pick this station here in Cordoba. Uh, when we see this one, we actually see, there it goes. Um, actually, let's go one farther to the north that's got more complete data. There we are. What you'll notice is that near Cordoba, or we can maybe just pick the city center here, um, we take a look at what some of these temperatures look like. And the numbers, there we are. How about this one uh, from Pilar? Look again at that ridiculous cold on February 18th, followed by the heat that came after it. But if you notice, over the last few days, they have had multiple 30 to 40 millimeter rainfall events. So these are these one to two inch rainfall events hitting this area. And if I just step over a bit, let's go to Santa Fe, which is right here. You'll see the same thing on temperatures, but extremely heavy rainfall. That's 100 millimeters of rainfall two days in a row. So we're talking about um, approaching eight inches of rainfall in places here uh, along the Paraná River. The forecast coming up continues to keep this whole area unsettled with more storms. Santa Fe is right here. So we continue to see a lot of heavy rain while Brazil sees some drier conditions. Now these drier conditions in Brazil, I'm not expecting major heat. If there's heat, it's gonna be primarily in the east, but um, there's still moisture coming in here. It's just drier than average. What we'll be watching for is if this continues. And if the MJO does what I mentioned it might do, I think that this is a possibly a likely forecast. No major indications of an early shutdown of the uh, Brazilian monsoon. This is all in the Amazon. But I, again, need to call this into question because I'm not right now trusting the European weeklies very well. So what I want to tell everyone is if you're watching South American market or South American production, this could become a concern if I'm still talking about it next week and the week following. So let's keep an eye on all this together, all right? I appreciate your extra attention tonight. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll talk again Tuesday morning. Thanks.